WordPress. Who of you in this room has ever used WordPress in their career? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Even though we're at the Python Developer Conference, it's half of the audience. And that's no surprise because WordPress is powering a third of the web, which I think is, is hugely impressive. And it's something where one obviously needs to ask why that is and how a single platform, a single software can be, can be so successful. And one part of this is obviously that it's very easy to install WordPress on a commodity web space that you get for a dollar a month everywhere. But I think for the most part, it's because of this. There's over 50,000 plugins you can extend WordPress with, most of them free, some of them commercial. Um, and they range from very simple things like embedding videos easier into your blog posts to very complex things. An example would be WooCommerce, which is a WordPress plugin and at the same time the most successful, the, the most popular e-commerce shop system on the web, um, which lives inside WordPress. So WordPress is a lot more than a content management system nowadays. It's an application platform, if you like. And um, you can like that or not like I'm not sure if it's a good idea to put a shop system into a content management system, um, but it's possible, <laughs> and it made WordPress hugely successful. Um, I'm the founder and um, main developer of Pretix, which is both a company and an open source project. It's a ticket shop application for, for events to sell event tickets, and it's based on Python and Django. And from the very beginning in 2014, when I started this project, a key design goal was to be extensible to not make people fork or patch or monkey patch or modify the software when they want to run it, because events are vastly different, they have different needs. Um, but I've seen it in other projects, what happens if, if um, versions diverge and if nobody um, is able to upgrade anymore and I didn't want to run in the, this situation. And there's lots of ideas um, how you could extend the software in a similar way on how, to, uh, how you could extend WordPress. For example, in a shop system, you might want to add additional payment methods, or you want to add additional export formats for weird accounting software in your country, um, or you want to add in completely different features. For example, instead of putting a shopping system into a content management system, we could put a content management system into a shop system, and we did. <laughs> So how do we go about building such a plugin system and how can we use it? And I want to talk about some things that Django has in store for us and some things that we need to add ourselves. So Django has a concept that you might all know that is called apps. And the Django documentation defines apps as a Python package that provides a set of features. But it's very vague. And it goes on and says applications may be reused in various projects. So most of you have probably one or rather multiple applications in your Django projects with your, that you built on your own and that are probably tightly intertwined. And you might be using a couple of apps from, from other authors that you actually reused. But it's not that simple. Reusable doesn't mean pluggable. Most Django apps out there like Let's take as a very simple example the Pulse application that um, you build when you follow the official Django tutorial. Um, you can, of course, add them into multiple different websites, but it's complex to install and integrate them. Um, you need to add them to your installed apps. You need to set up URLs. You need to somehow overwrite templates to make sure they fit into your page, and you can link between them back and forth. And they're meant for developers, not for users. They're fine. They can save you a lot of time. But it's not something that a user of your software, where by user I mean someone who installs your software on a server, um, might be able to do. So Django apps are mostly great for functionality that coexists, but is only loosely integrated, like having a news journal website that has a Pulse section, and you, you add in that third-party Pulse module there. Um, but it's not, it's not a plugin system already. The other thing that we have in Django is signals. And if you have never heard of signals, you can, signals are a thing that works like this. You basically define a signal. Signal is some event that happens, and you define it by um, instantiating the signal class. Um, and then you define receivers, which are functions that will be called whenever the signal is fired. And then you fire the signal by calling the dot send method on the signal. And behind the scenes, it's basically a list of functions. So whenever you, you use that dot receiver decorator, it adds a function to the list of functions. Whenever you 
do the send call, it calls every function in that list and collects the responses and gives them back to you. If you talk around to people around here, they will tell you signals are bad and evil and you shouldn't use them. And they tell you that for a reason. Because signals, when used wrongly, make your code paths hard to follow, make it hard to debug your software, and uh, therefore are often discouraged, especially to new users of Django, that you shouldn't overuse them. And I agree, you shouldn't overuse them. But there are some very valid use cases, especially when you try to integrate parts of applications that are controlled by different entities developing the software, which we will end up with. So what we basically want to do is use those concepts we have in Django of, of apps and signals and bring, use them to bring them closer together and make it easier for, for people to write plugins to your software. And one of the things um, I want to have for that is uh, auto-discovery of of plugins and easy installation. So what we do is in every plugin, we have a thunder init.py file, and um, it contains an app config, like modern Django apps do. It looks like any other Django app config. But we, we insert an inner class. That thousands of other ways you could do this, but we do it like the meta classes on, on models, where we specify, OK, this Django app is a plugin and should behave like our plugin mechanism does. And we can add additional metadata like name or versioning or whatever. And then we define a ready function because one thing you need to care about when using signals is that the file where your receivers are defined actually gets imported so that um, decorate is actually being executed and the function is actually added to the list of functions. Um, so that's a, the, a common source of error. And def we define that as the default app config for that Python module. Um, and it's fine. So in itself, this does nothing. Um, but when we combine it with a few other things, it will be. And one of those things is, is the setup.py file of our plugins. So our plugins are all installable pip packages. And um, they have a setup.py file, which defines the, the package metadata. And they have a an, um, um, user feature of the packaging ecosystem that is called entry points. Entry points are basically a plugin system on the level of, of, of PIP or of the Python packaging ecosystem. And when you can define a package in your, you can define an entry point in your package definition which basically says, I'm providing this feature. And then later you can query the package system to get you, give you all packages to implement that feature. The syntax is a bit weird, but can ignore that for now. And then in, in our main application, in our core application, we can go into our settings file and we can just iterate over all of the installed packages that have said, OK, I'm the plugin, I provide this functionality, and we can just add them to our install apps automatically. So now installation of those plugins is easy. It's something that every system administrator can do. It's basically pip install the plugin and then migrate. You cannot really do the migrate thing automatically because you might want to do it in a different environment with different database settings and so on. But everything else you can, you can put away, basically. Um, you might want to do some collect static stuff or anything, but you can integrate that if you want. Um, so, so that's nice. We can now easily install a plugin without changing any code. However, the, they are still not, the apps are still not talking to each other. And the, the plugins are still not doing anything. So, so the next thing we do is we want to do URL routing automatically. We want to make it possible for the plugins to register views that can actually be used. So we just put an URLs.py file into the plugin. It looks like any other Django application. Nothing special to it at all. Um, but in the URLs file of our main application, we um, iterate over all apps in our Django project filter out the ones that have said, OK, I want to be part of this plugin mechanism, Im check if they have an URL submodule. If so, import it, and then include those URL patterns. And then we include this list again into our main URL patterns. And this way, we automatically have namespacing. Like, we automatically assign um, a namespace based on the name of the plugin to all URLs. So your plugin authors don't need to think about clashing names with other plugins and can just easily define their views. And if you want to be do something more advanced and want to be more fancy, you could do things like automatically wrapping all those views in a decorator. You could just um, define a function that walks through a URL tree or a URL table and 
attaches the decorator to every view and then, then call that function when you include it. So for example, in this, uh, in this case, you would make sure that all views registered by plugins are only accessible by logged-in users, but you could do any permission checks you like or any other checks, which makes it harder for authors of plugins to screw things up, especially when things change in the main application, um, and, and allow you to enforce certain constraints on those, on those views. The other thing that we need, apart from URLs, is a way to make those views accessible. We need to make sure that somehow the link to the custom view of your plugin ends up in the global navigation of your main application. So we need to make it convenient to send signals in places where they can be really useful for simple things. For example, we use a custom template te um, tag that sends out a signal and collects all the responses and just outputs the, the, the responses as HTML. So you could have something like that in your navigation that just collects HTML snippets for the navigation from, from every plugin and puts them together. And the implementation of this tag is, uh, is pretty straightforward. It's mostly concerned with importing the signal that is specified as a string, so that's not, not really interesting. Um, then it iterates over all the responses that it gets, um, attaches them to a list of HTML snippets, and outputs that to the, to the template. So this way, it's, it's easy for both you and the plugin author to extend certain parts of your page. For example, the dashboard or the navigation or put additional things into the, the header to include additional CSS files and so on, whatever you need. And um, with those building blocks, we already got everything to build a pretty effective plugin system that makes it possible to, to easily inject additional functionality into our main application without making it completely messy and, and, and unable to, uh, unmaintainable. And we've done this for a few years, and some of the lessons that we learned is, for example, that's really good to use signals like they are in Django for simple, useful things, like inserting some HTML to your dashboard, doing an action after some business logic event happened, like doing something after an order was placed, doing something after an email was sent, but it doesn't make sense to use signals for complex interfaces. For example, one of the more complex things that plugins do in Pretix is um, payment providers. Like if you want to add Bitcoin in there, you can create a Bitcoin payment provider through a plugin. And we provide a class-based interfaces that we expect payment providers to implement. We have a base class that has some utilities and defines the interface. And plugins are supposed to subclass that interface and and, um, and implement their custom methods. And then we just use um, signals as a way to, to collect those classes and to discover them. There were other methods to discover them. You could use meta classes or you could use decorators on the class or whatever, but we decided to have signals as the, as the single point of communication inside the plugins. Um, so, yeah. And the other thing that we learned is that if you do such a thing, you really need to write documentation, because if you don't, nobody will ever write a plugin for your system. Um, another thing that, that comes in really handy is providing a cookie cutter template. If you've never heard of cookie cutter, it's basically a way to specify templates for, for source code projects or any projects of that matter. You can basically, it's, it's a template engine for folders, so you can you can specify all the boilerplate code that you need every time, and that can, can easily be included again. Um, I'm kind of running through this because I'm nervous and speaking quickly, so we have time for an advanced topic. That is nice. <laughs> um, our application is, is a multi-tenant application, and um, either, both if you self-host it and if you, we do the software as a service thing, and so we have very different clients using the application, and they all share one Django instance. And what we do is we provide them with a list of, of plugins that are available, and we allow them to turn them on or off per client. And this is really, really useful for a number of reasons. First of all, it keeps your user interface simple. If you have a customer who doesn't need a certain feature, you can just switch it off completely. You just switch it off. In that case, no signals of that plugin will be called for that customer, and the functionality is just gone. And if they need it, you can just turn it on again. You can use that, this, this approach even if you're not building an open source application where other people write plugins. You could also use it in closed source software to, for example, easily hide things behind a feature flag. You could use it to easily implement pricing tiers if you have specific functionality 
that's only um, available to, to customers who, who paid a certain amount. You could just use a similar mechanism to just turn off parts of your functionality completely for them. And yeah, it's, it's, it's working really well for us. And the way you implement it is, is basically you need to somehow store the list of plugins that are enabled for a client or a tenant. And in our case, we just store a comma separated list of strings um, because it's simple. And then we, we roll our own version of Signal, which is a subclass of, of Django signals. And it works the same way, except that it, um, that only, um, that it requires a client object to be passed as a sender. Sender is kind of a weird concept in Django's signal. Signals somehow expect that there's a special argument to the signal, which is the sender, which makes sense in one, some cases, but not in others, but it's in there. So we reuse it here, and only if the, the, uh, the plugin is active for that sender, we actually send out the signal. Um, so how deciding that again is let's if uninteresting code of getting the Python module of a function and then searching if it's in that list. Um, but you, get pro you probably get the basic idea. The, and then we use the approach that I talked earlier about, um, automatically applying a decorator to all views of a plugin to make sure only v views are only accessible if that plugin is enabled for that client. Um, so yay, that's a plugin system. Um, it works really well for a couple of years now. We, there's on GitHub and in our internal repositories, there's around 50 plugins for our software. Um, so the approach is proven to, to, to actually work, and other people wrote plugins and extended functionality. Um, and there's not a lot missing. There's one thing missing that people often ask for, and it's if you go if you think WordPress, you think logging into your web interface and installing a plugin through the web interface. And I would say, yeah. Let's just not do that. Um, it works really, really badly with modern deployment strategies. In a containerized environment, you cannot modify the source code, or you shouldn't really modify the source code <laughs> of the application that's currently running. Um, it works w badly if you run on multiple application servers. And it's basically remote code execution by a network. It's not really something you want to do. OK. Um, I think. I have a lot of time left for questions, and even if those questions are, please show that slide again for longer, because I was a quick, uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thank you, indeed. We have a bunch of time for questions, so please line up at the microphone here, or ask questions online on Slack or IRC or Twitter, which is uh, DjangoCon QA. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I probably have like a bunch of questions, and sure. I might want to talk to you after so that I don't bore everybody else. Uh, but my question is, with a plugin system, have you ever run into a case where you wanted to add a field to an existing model, and did you uh, resort to contribute to class, or did you find another way to do it? Uh, you mean like that a plugin extends an existing model from the base application? Yes. Yeah. Now we have always avoided to do that. In that case, we would create a separate model in the plugin and have a one-to-one -one relationship, um, because you would end up with really weird compatibility problems. Probably if you if you use contribute to class or something like that. Um, I haven't actually explored it. I think I wouldn't like it from a design perspective. Okay, but if you use one-to-one -one relationship, are you, are you not afraid to end up with really long queries that like link five models together uh, because there are five one-to-one -one relationships? So far not. Um, since the base application doesn't know about the plugins, the only way such a long query could exist is from the plugin. And it doesn't happen that often that a plugin goes through different plugins to build a query. Just didn't occur. It, it's not a problem in practice so far. I see your point, though. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, so first off, a mating approach to um, enable and disable plugins based on the tenant. Um, because I was assuming uh, installation in your case means activation because you also added to installed applications, but nicely done there. Um, on that theme, another question, what could Django do to make your plugin infrastructure any easier? Is there something we could add? And following that, what would be needed that this plugin approach, because it's probably not that much code, but still a little bit of code, um, to put this into a separate application and open source it? I'm not sure. Um, so the thing is, it's, the system is very opinionated on the one part, so I'm not sure it would be something that everyone agrees on is the right way to do this. The other thing is that um, it's not a lot of code, and a lot of that code depends on your special case. For example, this multi-tenant thing, um, I shared it with the client model, but for us it's, it's tightly integrated with our customer model, and yeah, it's, 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 we thought about moving it out into a separate repository, and there's someone, there was a threat on Django developers a couple of months ago on this topic. Uh, I think the subject is dynamic, dynamic uploading or something like that, and somebody on that thread, thread implemented a different approach to the same problem that uh, he put out as a separate library, so that's something that you might want to check out. It's a little bit different, but the basic idea is the same. Um, so I think Django shouldn't do a lot about it, but just not deprecating signals, which some people ask for at some point. <laughs> so that would be nice. Hey. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell me if your plugin system is pluggable in the sense that I could use it in another project where I would like to have plugins. So <laughs> basically, the code examples that I showed are simplified a little, but they are all working, and it's not much more going on. So it's basically the same answer as to the previous question. Yes, it's, it's hard to, to pull it out. It's easy to transfer to another application. The person standing in, hind, in, in line after you has copied it to two other applications, so we know it works in, <laughs> in multiple applications. All right, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, can you speak to managing dependencies and conflicts with your plugins? Like plugins might only work with a certain version of, of Pretix, of the base system, yeah. or might maybe conflict with other plugins or even depend on other plugins. Yeah. That's one of the pain points at the moment. We haven't solved that yet um, because um, plugins can currently not specify if they're specific to a certain version of the base application and we We'd love to, to, to have that checked at pip install time. It would be easy to check it at, um, at runtime, but that might be too late to, to trigger an error if there is something that, yeah, if it imports something that doesn't exist anymore and so on. Um, we're currently avoiding that problem by all plugins maintained by us are being released on the same date as <laughs> the releases of the, of the main project, which is not a long-term viable solution. Um, we're still looking for a good idea there. Hi, really great approach. Um, if you could tell me in terms of migration, like in admin area when you enable disable plugin, can we, migration can be done on that side so we don't need to do on a kind of terminal level. You, are you talking about database migrations? Or, yes. You know, so database migrations come pretty much automatically in this approach because every plugin has, has their own and you can just run migrate and it does the right thing. Because it's Django apps, basically. OK, and did you explore a bit of uh, Django app registration? Because some of the like a code that can be used, so is there any kind of disadvantage compared to some of the like signaling approach? Django app registration, I have never heard of that as a name, so I might not know the project that you're talking about. OK. I'm I'll happy to take a look at it. Yeah. Sure. One more question. Um, you said that you purposefully do not support one of WordPress's uh, main advantages, that is just hitting click on a plugin and having it installed, which I get remote code execution isn't fun. But have you considered having a plugin registry where people can at least search for plugins, even if they cannot install them directly without help of their systems administrator. Yes, I have considered that. I haven't found the time to build it. There's, un 
ni the nice thing about the open source project is someone just a couple of weeks ago created an, like the, these GitHub repositories, awesome dot anything for, for plugins to Pretix. So I'm just referring to that one for now. <laughs> but yeah, there will be something like that. Thank you. <laughs> How can someone uh, discover uh, new plugins? Something like, uh, for example, in WordPress, uh, something like a marketplace um, we, where one can see a list of plugins. And yeah, that's, and that's basically something, um, the same answer to the previous question. We currently don't have a good way for that. I'd love to have a way. Yeah. Um, I'd love to do this in a way that's also, like, it's doing this is not so much code. It's maybe not worth it to pull it into a library, but if more projects use this approach, it might be, or similar projects, it might be worth to have an application for such plugin marketplaces that is reusable across projects. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to build that for years, I just don't get around to do it. So if anyone wants to talk about that at the sprints, feel free to approach me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there don't seem to be any questions online. Um, thank you, Raphael. Thank and you. yeah, that was a...